This is Ivan Paz Solar Power Facility, a sci-fi monument in the high Mojave Desert that promised to usher in an age of endless solar energy. But just 11 years after it opened, Ivan Paz is headed for bankruptcy. So what happened? And what does it mean for the future of solar power plants? Ironically, it was the incredible success of solar power that led to its demise, which might sound weird. So let's figure this out together. I'm Ricky, and this is Tube of DaVinci. This video is brought to you by MOVA. Now, if this story sounds familiar, that's because we made a video about Crescent Dunes solar thermal power plant a couple of years ago, which we'll link here. And Ivan Pot is similarly a solar thermal plant. That means it doesn't use photovoltaic panels like the ones you might have on your roof. Instead, it concentrates solar into a collector and then powers steam turbines with it. But one big difference was that Crescent Dunes was a molten salt plant. That led to a lot of challenges and issues that was not in Ivanpah. But both have mirrors called heliostats that are positioned on articulating arms to collect the sun, no matter what time of day, into a central tower. Both plants cost around $2 billion and both ended up failing. The Ivanpah Solar Electric Generation System is also a concentrated solar power plant. It became famous in 2014, winning all sorts of awards and accolades and claiming the title as the world's largest solar thermal plant at the time. The complex is made of three independent power plants or units. In each solar plant, one Rankine cycle reheat steam turbine receives live steam from the solar collector. Each plant also includes two natural gas fired steam boilers, an auxiliary boiler and a nighttime preservation boiler. So I know what you're probably thinking, this is a solar power plant, it's supposed to be clean and carbon free, but it does have natural gas boilers. The idea is that it helps in the morning to get the entire system up to speed quicker. And it also helps in transient cloudy conditions in order to maintain the steam turbines. Ivanpah has a nameplate capacity of 386 megawatts across all three units. And the plant directly produces AC power, unlike the DC power that comes from PV cells. And Ivanpah at its peak provides electricity for 140,000 California residents. This plant costs $2.2 .2 billion, about $5,600 per kilowatt. Now this is going to be important here in a minute. And where did the money come from? $1.6 billion came from a loan from the Department of Energy, $300 million from NRG Energy, $168 million from Google, and $132 million from BrightSource, which is now called Kelvin Energy. And this absolutely massive site takes up about 3,500 acres in the high Mojave Desert. There's 173,500 computer controlled heliostats and they move to make sure that the sun coming in is always concentrated onto the central tower. And all in, they take up about 27 million square feet or 627 acres of active energy capacity. Now the towers, though of which there are three, each are approximately 140 meters or 459 feet tall. That's one and a half times the height of the Statue of Liberty. And then there is the receiver, which sits on the very top of each tower, collecting all the sunlight and boiling water. These receivers heat water to capture superheated steam and then run through a turbine. Very different from the Crescent Dune design, which had a tower of hot molten salt, which then ran through a heat exchanger to produce steam and then run the turbine. In many ways, Ivanpah was simpler, although the steam only could reach temperatures of about 510 degrees Celsius. Crescent Dunes operated at much higher temperatures thanks to its molten salt formulation, almost 1112 degrees Fahrenheit or 600 degrees Celsius. Now, another drawback of the thermal approach is that they require water. But before I get into that, check this out. This is my new favorite time-saving hack, the MOVA flagship P50 Pro Ultra. This sleek robot vacuum comes with upgraded dirt detection sensors, 19,000 pascals of suction power, and dual rotating mop. Its mop removal and clean lift system brings dynamic coordination between the main brush, side brush, and mop, keeping wet and dry messes separated, and lifts the mop entirely over rugs and carpet. Corners are no match for the P50 thanks to the mop extension and robo swing brush that gets into even the tightest of corners. It cleans multiple surfaces and can vacuum tile, wood, and concrete as well as low and high profile carpet. The clean chop brush prevents hair tangles on long and short hair. When the P50 is ready to return to its dock, it uses heated 75 degrees Celsius water to clean and 45 degrees Celsius air to dry the mops, maximizing hygiene and reducing odors. The automated dust bin captures dust for up to 75 days. Just fill the four liter water bin, empty the three and a half liter dirty water bin, and the P50 is good to go for days at a time. Now the P50 Pro Ultra is available for pre-sale, so secure your spot in line now using our links in the description and lock in the early bird price for when it's available. Huge thanks to MOVA and you. Now back to the show. 
Ivanpah's cooling system is limited to a combined 100 acre feet per year of water for the plant's operations. That was a strict requirement to make sure that they were very cognizant of how much water they were using. So then finally, you might be wondering, why use mirrors at all? Well, to start, you have the potential to collect more energy. If a PV panel is around 20% efficient, the solar electric conversion efficiency of a thermal plant is likely about 40%, all factors taken in. And the plant promised to produce 1 million megawatt hours annually of electricity. But the site was plagued with issues and constantly fell short of these projections. Now, to fully understand the failure of Ivanpah, we have to look at the timelines. This project was originally proposed in 1999 to 2000, with Bryce Source Energy leading the development. And construction didn't happen until late 2010. This is important to keep in mind. And it wasn't commercially operational until early 2014. And if you're wondering why the high Mojave Desert, check this out. This is a picture showing you the kilowatt hours per meter squared per day. And the areas in red have the most potential. It's also a very barren place. There's very little in the way of plants, vegetation, or animals. Now, there are some. There was an endangered species of desert tortoise that had to be relocated, which caused some concerns and also led to some of those delays. But upon completion, Ivanpah did produce electricity. Here's a look at Ivanpah Towers 1, 2, and 3 and how much energy it produced. Interestingly, like we mentioned, there's sun and NG, which is natural gas, because there is some natural gas being used. And here's the totals. Now, between the three, we were supposed to get a million megawatt hours. And it looks like in any given year, the best year was 2020 at about 285. That's for Tower 1. Similar story for Tower 2 and for Tower 3. Now, one of the reasons why Ivanpah failed to reach its targets year and year again is because it's incredibly complicated. Think about how many moving parts there are. Every one of these heliostats has actuators and motors and controllers to track the sun. Now, I just wanted to show you something. If you zoom in here, you notice all these mirrors that look kind of out of place. Those are all heliostats that are not aimed correctly. It should be uniform, but you can see that they're not all working. And this is part of the problem. So that's a major problem because that efficiency that I mentioned, 40% versus the 20 for PV, that depends on every one of those mirrors working correctly. And at best, you lose efficiency and at worst, you can have problems. For example, in 2016, they had a fire at one of the towers because some of the mirrors were actually reflecting on a different part of the tower, not the collector on top. And they had to shut the plant down and fix it. it took a couple of months and the plant was offline. And they've struggled with some of these challenges time and time again. One of the talking points I've heard over and over for concentrated solar is that it kills birds. And that is kind of true. Obviously, you've got these mirrors that kind of look like a lake when you look down from above because it reflects the sky. And so you've got birds kind of flying toward it. It also has all that light, which attracts insects, which then attracts birds, which then attracts higher, larger birds of prey. And it's kind of a vicious cycle. And don't forget that this is also a very windy and sandy environment. So sand gets into the grease, into the actuators, into the motors, and the gears, and the transmissions, and it causes challenges. The maintenance for a plant like this is really, really high. It's not just a one-time cost up front, it's also the recurring cost. Now, part of the reason why I'm making this video is because I got a letter from my utility company telling me that our natural gas prices are gonna go up, they always do, but that our electricity prices are gonna come down. I have lived in San Diego for over 15 years and they've never gone down. Now, the reason why the prices are gonna fall this year is because PG&E, Southern California Edison, and stg &E, the big utilities here in California, have all backed out of their power purchase agreement. It turns out it wasn't just that they got financing from the Department of Energy, but they also struck a deal to charge rate customers in California $200 per megawatt hour, which was dramatically higher than the average of between 35 and 50. So they were charging us more money. And this plant is a part of why the prices for electricity in California are so high and why now that it's shutting down, they're not going to have to buy from them and they can actually lower prices. Now, that's kind of insane, especially considering just how much of a markup people were charging. Also, don't forget that they were using natural gas to heat up the plant. I'll break it down this way. A traditional PV solar farm would produce energy kind of like this, right? Peaking around noon and fall just like that. But with Ivanpah, what traditionally happens is that water 
would have to be heated before it would actually produce any energy. So normally it would look like this, probably. But then you get power later in the day, which you wouldn't get. But really, you're not producing any more energy, you're just phase shifting it. But that's not what Ivanpah actually did. Ivanpah used natural gas to heat the tower early on in the day, so that way it was warm and ready to work. And then it extended that time out into the evening. So it was producing more energy. But the reason why it was producing more energy is because it used natural gas in the early part of the day. The part that's crazy about this story is that because they had a power purchase agreement for $200 per megawatt hour, they were incentivized to burn as much natural gas as possible. Natural gas costs way less than that, around $30 per megawatt hour. So they could burn natural gas at $30 per megawatt hour and then sell it to us here in California for $200. And so they had the wrong incentive structure to burn natural gas and kind of take away from the fact that it's supposed to be a source of clean energy. But ultimately, the biggest factor for why Ivanpah ultimately failed is because that nobody could have seen how much solar prices would plummet. Here is a graph of the levelized cost of energy for PV solar here on the left and the concentrated solar power on the right. When Ivanpah was first pitched, you could see that the price for PV solar was up here. By the time it was actually built, it had already come down to here. And by the time we were operating it, the price, the levelized cost of photovoltaic power had plummeted to here. And this is what they couldn't have seen coming. Obviously the CSP prices have also come down, but this drop in solar panel power pricing is the game changer. I'll share just a little bit of an anecdote. When I first got my first system, I paid $10,000, dollars for a 1.1 kilowatt system. That is $10 per watt to install. Then I had a company install my panels on my house a few years ago here in my new place, and that cost $3 per watt. But even more recently, just last month, we installed an additional system on our house that we did ourselves. And here's the breakdown. We had 20 panels, which cost $2,800. It cost $1,500 in microinverters, about $2,000 for racking all the hardware and the wire, and finally about $1,000 in labor for the team to install it. That comes out to about $7,000 for a seven kilowatt system, $1 per watt, 10 times cheaper than what I paid for my original panels in 2010. In fact, solar prices have gotten so cheap, I've heard of stories of farmers putting solar panels instead of fences because solar panels are cheaper than wood fencing or brick or anything else. Obviously there's more cost in terms of inverters and wiring and stuff, but that's insane. And that's the disruption that made Ivanpah completely fall flat because nobody could have seen just how affordable these panels would become. You gotta remember this project started in 2000. And back then, panels were really expensive, and this sounded kind of like a genius move. Mirrors are pretty cheap, relatively speaking. And all the hardware and the space that was available, it kind of made sense. But over the years, it just continued to make less and less sense. So then, solar in the desert was a huge failure, and I can already see the comment section if you hate solar power, and you're saying, I told you so, we shouldn't spend money on these kinds of things. And I gotta tell you, it's the exact opposite. Check this out. Here's Ivanpah, right? And right next to it, look at this massive farm. And that is on the California side. But here on the Nevada side, there's even more. All of these are massive, like 250 megawatt systems. And that's just here. And look at this, more solar farm. We've got even more over here. And if we scroll up, look at this, endless, endless farms. In fact, solar power plants in Nevada are absolutely blowing up as time has gone by. Photovoltaic has been taking over. And while stories about failure always seep into the headlines, what people don't realize is just how much power these plants are producing. But there is one problem. Ultimately, the challenge is not just adding more solar panels. That's only half the equation. Because what you'll do is you'll provide way too much energy when there's no demand for it. And then be beholden to natural gas or other peak or power plants or base power stations for the rest of it. And this is the problem with solar. But the really good news is solar power coupled with battery storage is coming. And this is the blueprint for how we do it. This is the Gemini solar power plant and it introduces two really amazing things. First of all, a massive solar farm. This is good for 690 megawatts of capacity, which is gonna put it right there at the very top of the largest in Nevada. But 
what makes this really special is it's combined with 1400 megawatt hours of battery storage. That's good for 300 megawatts of output for four hours at a time. Now what we can do is instead of taking this energy and exporting it, we could cut that off and store this in a battery and then provide that power throughout the night. If there's seven hours of sunshine, that means you need 17 hours of storage, right? So you build the systems accordingly. And this, I think, is the blueprint for how we go from here. Now, Ivanpah isn't just going to disappear overnight. They're gonna shut down two of the three plants in 2026, and then from there, they're just gonna taper this out. But what they should do, they have the land already acquired, they have the footings and everything else, just convert it to PV and add battery storage. But you have to admire Ivanpah for what it was. As an idea from 2000, what execution, what a absolute array of mirrors in the desert. It looks like something from a sci-fi movie, something aliens built. I'm always blown away when I fly over it and see it. It was an engineering marvel and it was a thought experiment worth doing. Now we know that sometimes you have to really be cognizant and aware of just how much disruption is going to happen. And this is the problem that I see for many large scale infrastructure projects. When you start something, if you make it difficult in terms of permitting and approvals, like we have in many parts, especially in California, then it takes so long to get approvals and then to build it. And by the time we build it, is it going to still be worth it then? I made a video about high-speed trains, for example, and that's the perfect example. If we make high-speed rails a reality, but it costs so much money and it takes so long, what if robo-taxis and self-driving cars and electric short-haul flights come in together and take away the demand. That's always the risk. And that's why we have to be really clever and smart about how we allocate resources and which projects we prioritize. Because the best of intentions is only half the equation. The other part is having a little bit of a sense of where the future is headed and skating toward that. All right, if you thought that was cool, check out this video next. I think you're going to also like. And don't forget to hit like and subscribe. Leave us your comments. Let us know. Thank you so much for watching. I'm Ricky with Tuba Da Vinci. We'll catch you guys next week.